Good morning, my beautiful babes and babettes. Hey, morning video. That's getting increasingly rare. But I am your resident active advocate, and I would like to talk to you today about the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh, and it's so cute. I cannot believe I have not seen this movie until actually just a few days ago. This movie and these stories were not part of my childhood. I read the book even just like within the past year and a half, two years for the first time. And it's so cute. Um, but in order to ruin some childhoods, I am going to point out the array of disability narratives present in this story. And there are three most prominent that I would like to discuss. Firstly is Pooh with compulsive eating. Secondly is Eeyore with his clinical depression. And thirdly is Tigger with what could be classified as ADHD. All right, so to be it, Pooh, compulsive eating disorders. These are basically classified as eating too much rather than eating too little. This is sort of the opposite of anorexia bulimia. It is the reverse side of that in that rather than saying, I compulsively refuse to eat because I want to be thin, because I want to be beautiful, whatever our society defines as beautiful, um, rather than that, it is more in the way that your brain does not have the quote off switch to tell you when your body is full. So poo always is in pursuit of food. To be fair, in the real world, bears eat a lot, okay? But in this world, these stories were all made up by Christopher Robin's father, A.A. Mill, right? And Christopher Robin, was his son, is a real person. And he actually really, as far as I've heard, does not like these stories because the feeling is that his father commandeered his childhood because Christopher Robin had a very vivid imagination and really would go out into the forest, as far as I'm aware, and play with his toys in these ways and create these adventure scenarios for his toys and for himself and have these interactions all in his imagination. So I actually really admire the storytelling potential of, at the time, this very young boy. But then at the same time, I'm not entirely certain that what his father did in taking those stories and making them public was the best possible parenting move, but I can't be the one to judge real life people. You know, they, have probably taken it up amongst themselves. But, all right, so in the case of Winnie the Pooh, he is a compulsive eater. And oftentimes in the real world, such disorders as compulsively eating, as hoarding, um, you know, like sort of these unbounded kind of addictions, compulsive gambling, they are used in our lives to fill what we perceive as a whole. So how are we incomplete? More than a physical disorder, these are often mental disorders. There is a perception, even an unspoken one or an unconscious one, of a sense of incompleteness. And you see these all the time being trotted out into popular media, basically for just pure schadenfreude on the part of the observers. You know, you see with My 600 Pound Life, with all these hoarder shows, um, used to see it with The Biggest Loser, but that one has lost its popularity because of very bad things that went on behind the scenes on those shows. But the whole idea is that behind the disorder itself, there is often a feeling of lack in the person's life. So that could be the case with Pooh, but you can't really diagnose a fictional character in this way. Um, because, again, it's, it's inside of a boy's imagination, but it's not to say that Christopher Robin himself had any of these disorders, okay? This is all just make-believe on his part. 
Um, all right, so the next case I would like to discuss is Eeyore. He has what could be classified as unipolar depression, okay? Bipolar depression is that some days you might be on an upswing, whoop, some days you might be on a downswing, phew, right? And on the days when you're on a downswing, it's the same as unipolar depression, but we'll, it will get there. You know, you're, eh, you're low energy, you're down in the dumps. Depression, by the way, I need to clarify for those who have not heard me give this explanation before. Depression is not continual or clinical degrees of sadness. It can be classified more along the lines of a lack of emotion, of a lack of feeling. You know, it's not sadness, it's apathy more than sadness, often compounded by fatigue, by, you know, just a, just a lack of energy. You don't necessarily want to get out of bed and do things. And these can all be theoretically at least, improved by therapy, by medications, and so forth. But there are many forms of depression, both bipolar and unipolar, that are drug resistant, that can be therapy resistant. It all depends on the person. It all depends on the person's biology. I would like to state again, because I probably did bring this point up in my video or videos on depression, this is not weakness, okay? The Western society especially has a tendency to classify depression as a form of weakness that you cannot deal with your emotions and just be happy. That does not help. That does not help because it's part of a person's biochemistry to have depression. Oftentimes the requirement for depression will be some sort of external trigger, but if it's written into your genetic code and you have that external trigger, then there's basically no, no escaping it. It can be written into your genes. It can be purely environmental. There's all sorts of different factors that go into creating both bipolar and unipolar depression. So bipolar, you'll have downswings and upswings. But with unipolar depression, it's basically just a constant down. And that's not to say that the person will, you know, keep going down, keep going down, keep going down until some level of termination, shall we say, is reached. Basically what I'm saying is that people with depression will not necessarily have suicidal tendencies. That, um, that is not necessarily the case. That is not always the case. You know, everyone when it comes to depression is different. But when it comes to Eeyore, basically he seems to still have the energy to go on these adventures with his friends and to do things for himself. But basically you see, or you hear him saying quite often, thanks for noticing me, or thanks for paying attention. And you know, these sort of halfway cynical <laughs> kinds of remarks, but it's just his way more or less of bonding with his friends because he does recognize the fact that there are friends around him. There are people or creatures who care about him. And while, it, you know, human relationship can ease depression, it is not a, quote, cure. I don't approve of the cure narrative when it comes to disability because there's not going to be one magical thing that fixes everything in a person's life. If a thing has multiple causes, it's going to take multiple solutions. If there can be any combination of, quote, solutions that will, quote, cure this illness or this disability. And again, it will not always be the case that there will be. There's no such thing as magic. There is such a thing as biology. And how our biology is determined comes out of both our genes and our environment. There can be things that ease it. There can be things that help it. Human companionship is often one of those things. But we can't be looking for, quote, magic or, quote, miracle cures when it comes to these things. And especially to the extent where we think that, well, if this isn't doing it for the person, then they're not trying. That's not how this works. You know, I can't try to 
Oh, what's a good example of this? I can't try to drive a truck. That's a really bad idea for me. I have a visual impairment. No one in their right mind would advise that I get behind the wheel of a truck, especially since I don't have a license. So not only is that illegal, but it's also very illogical for me. If you were to take the whole schema of depression into the physical and say, this is just how the brain works. You know, one way that my mother described it to me once was that if you had a broken arm, you'd go to the doctor for that, you know, and no one would judge you. They would say, oh, good for you, you know, doing the right thing by your arm and splinting it up and, you know, just waiting for things to get better. It's the same with depression. I'm not weak for having a broken arm. I'm not weak for having depression or bipolar disorder. Same with Eeyore, okay? And the fact is, Eeyore, in this story, and you can hear the smile coming into my voice, it's so cute. He's surrounded by people and animals who care about him, and that's a good thing. You know, we need human connection, but we can't expect it to magically cure everything. All right, that shouldn't be the expectation. The expectation should be that we mutually give and take and that we try and support one another because people need that. Lastly, the narrative surrounding Tigger. Clear cut case here, I believe, of ADHD. Um, hang on. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. That's what that stands for. There is AD and there is HD, and there is ADHD, okay? These are two separate disorders being put together into one disorder. There can be separate instances, there can be AD, and there can be HD, independent of one another, but they can also come together, which you hear of much more often, to create ADHD. When it comes to the animal friends in the forest, you can see that they're all rather playful, that they are all, mo oh, well, mostly rather energetic. You know, they like to go on adventures and have games together and, you know, just sport around and have fun. Tigger takes that to another level entirely, to the point where almost every other animal, except for Rue, and Rue is a very small animal and very young, he's still a child in the context of this narrative, as opposed to the other animals who are adults. Um, other than Rue, most of the other animals are, are either put off by Tigger or are exhausted by Tigger. And the whole narrative there is that people with ADHD are often portrayed as wearing on the nerves and the moods and just the general energy level of the people around them who do not have the same level of energy that they do. So uh, the higher level of energy from the person with ADHD will drain the energy from all the people around them who are, quote, forced to deal with them bouncing off the walls. And you really do see this with Tigger. He is literally a bouncing tiger. <laughs> That's exactly what he is. You know, their bottoms are made out of rubber. Their tops are made out of springs, right? <laughs> So um, the whole narrative about him not being able to control his own energy level and Rabbit especially is put off by this and tries to literally keep him grounded. By the end of the movie, he's saying to Tigger, no more bouncing. And, you know, you promise never to bounce again. Don't you ever bounce again. But you see Tigger get very downtrodden by this because... This is the way in which he expresses himself. This is the way in which he sheds the excess energy. This is very much true to real life. I find that in cases of people with attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder or both, it takes more and different activities than it would take a, quote, neurotypical person to settle down into a, some kind of holding pattern. Um, our education system is becoming unfit for more than one reason, but especially in the case of kids with AD or HD or ADHD, it's very difficult, very, very difficult for them to sit down and shut up in the traditional classroom setting of sit down and shut up and do what teacher tells you. They have too much 
energy. They have too much going on inside their minds. They can't be forced into a box, as Rabbit tries to do with Tigger by keeping him grounded, literally. They can't be forced into a box and be told to think and behave in only this one predetermined by the system way. You guys know I'm not a big fan of systems, especially of hierarchical systems, and the traditional school system does present a hierarchy. It was really only when I hit university that this hierarchy began to be shed. You know, I had professors who told me to call them by their first name. And coming from the traditional Catholic education in which I was raised, I went to Catholic school in both elementary school and high school. Um, coming out of those much more traditional sit down and shut up and listen to what I say settings, it was sort of difficult for me at first to see my professors um, more or less as equals to myself, you know, and the whole fact of my being an adult or more or less by the time I hit university didn't really click until I met my favorite professor who always from day one treated me as an equal, as his intellectual equal. And after that, it was to the point where it's like, yeah, I will call you by your first name. Yeah, I will challenge you in class. Yes, I will ask my questions freely. And it actually became the norm for me to expect that from professors because that's usually what I got. In the cases where I did not get that, that actually started putting me off to the professors who really were of the sit down, shut up and do as I say model that I associated more with my earlier schooling, that really started to put me off because there's a lot, I'm not bragging here, but there's a lot going on up here inside my head, right? And I feel like if I can keep up, I should be allowed to express my voice, to ask my questions the way I need to in order to better facilitate my own learning. It's very much the same in cases of people with AD or HD or ADHD because they have a different mode of expression and of mental energy than what we are taught we should have in the traditional school system. So when it comes to the case of Tigger versus Rabbit, Tigger high energy, Rabbit very low energy tries to keep Tigger grounded for the sake of Rabbit's own convenience, I might add, not for Tigger's welfare or anything of that nature, for the sake of Rabbit's own convenience, um, you really see a dip in Tigger's mood and attitude towards life. And by the end, he's so sad and so downtrodden by what Rabbit is doing, you know, don't you dare bounce, you promised you wouldn't bounce ever, ever again. Um, it doesn't work. And the rest of the animals and Christopher Robin all come to Tigger's defense. And that is not actually in the book. That is movie exclusive. But I think it's really sweet that the rest of the community comes and says, no, this is just who Tigger is. This is just who he is. This is how he behaves. And we shouldn't expect him to be or act in any other way because this is him. You know, it's... It translates quite well, I think, to the real world, to the system that says, basically, thou shalt not, and, you know, sit down, shut up, and do as I say, as I keep repeating <laughs> in this video. That does not work for people who are narrow atypical in this particular way, or in these particular ways, because, as I say, attention deficit, <laughs> hyperactivity disorder, <laughs> attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You know, these are three different things. There are three different, quote, conditions, but I don't necessarily view them as quote, conditions because it's just a different way in which the mind functions. And people with AD or HD or ADHD are just as intelligent as everybody else. It's just that they express their intelligence. They express their mental activity in different ways than the average bear is taught to express theirs. Yes, that was a reference to Pooh Bear, <laughs> not to Yogi Bear. I, th that, show, that show was weird. But anyway, um, so that's my hot take on three 
of the characters in Winnie the Pooh. I'm sure that if you searched around, um, you could find more understated disability narratives in this movie slash book. Um, like Rabbit, you could say there's something going on in there because he's very self-obsessed and he wants others to do exactly as he says. Um, Owl, you know, the whole, I'm very intelligent and look how smart I am. Um, sort of narrative going on there. Kanga could be said to have anxiety, but I don't really read too far into those because there are clever look at me people <laughs> pointing at myself here. Um, you know, there are people who can be quite demanding of those around them. Um, and there are anxious mothers out there for good reason. And I don't consider any of those necessarily to be conditions of any kind. It, you know, just different personality types. And that's neither here nor there when it comes to disability narrative, I don't think. So, yeah, that's my hot take on that. And I will see what movie slash narratives we have going on for tomorrow because I can't remember. And I will talk to y'all tomorrow. Thank you for your lovely participation in, and um, interaction. And leave me your comments, questions, snide remarks down below. Thank you. Bye. Mwah.